On behalf of all assembled here today, I should now like to invite our newest alumnus, Dr. Alan Bernstein, to address convocation. Thank you very much. Baggy, I could hear you, love to hear you talk all afternoon about me. <laughs> uh, and thank you very much for that uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, Baggy and I do go back uh, a long way, uh, as he said, back to the founding of a new institute, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Chancellor, uh, President Chakma, uh, faculty, members of the 2019 graduating class, uh, family and relatives out in the dark here, ladies and gentlemen. I, I want to begin by acknowledging and applauding the visionary legacy that outgoing President and Vice Chancellor Amit Chakma has contributed to this great university. Amit has been a great leader at a time when leading universities is no easy task. Congratulations, Amit, on your wonderful leadership of this university. I would also like to pay a personal tribute to Joe Rotman, whose visionary support for Western, both during the all too brief time he served as chancellor and as a philanthropist and visionary. It was Joe who convinced the university to launch the Rotman Institute of Philosophy here at Western University. I proudly serve as a member of the Rotman's Institute of Advi Institute's Advisory Committee. I'm not a philosopher, so it's not clear to me why I'm on the committee, uh, but I, uh, I take that, my job very seriously, and I think it's my role to ask the dumb questions uh, uh, during, the, during our annual meetings. I would also like to acknowledge both Professor Charles Ware, who served as one of the early directors of the Rotman, and its current director, Professor Christopher Smeek. Both Charles and Chris have served with distinction, and I know that Joe would be very proud to see how the Institute is thriving today as one of Canada and the world's leading centers for the study of philo the philosophy of science. I am deeply honored to be addressing this year's graduating class. I know how hard each of you have worked for your degree, and so my first congratulations are to you, this year's graduating class. But my second and maybe biggest congratulations are to your parents. Uh, today, today symbolizes, uh, to them, today symbolizes uh, many things. Uh, one more step in the fulfillment of their dreams for you, and a giant step towards independence. Um, theirs, by the way, not yours. <laughs> and perhaps one day paying back all those tuition fees. <laughs> and thinking about what I'd like to talk to you about today, I thought I'd like to talk to you about my walk to work. When I walk to CIFAR's offices uh, in Toronto, I pass three historic plaques commemorating the world-changing contributions of a politician and diplomat, a computer scientist, and two cancer researchers. I'd like to tell you a little bit about each of them and perhaps what lessons we can learn from them. The first plaque I pass is to Lester Pearson. He lived at this house on Admiral Road and I walk by it every morning when it's nice weather. Former Canadian Prime Minister. Pearson won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1957 for his many contributions to peace, including most notably his contributions to resolving the Suez Canal crisis of 1956. At that time, the UN General Assembly had put forward a toothless resolution to urging the British, the French, the Israelis, and the Egyptians to play nicely. Pearson recognized that the res resolution lacked any provision for solving the problem. He proposed instead an international peace force, the UN Peace Force, which became instrumental in averting a crisis, an international crisis, right at the heart of the middle of the, of the Cold War. He grew up north of Toronto, where his father was a Methodist university, graduated from university, where he excelled in rugby and basketball, and later when he went to Oxford uh, in hockey. I think it must have been easy to excel in hockey at Oxford, actually. <laughs> He served in World War I, uh, serving in the Royal Flying Corps, and survived a crash during his very first training flight. The second plaque I pass commemorates Beatrice Worsley, one of the world's very first female computer scientists. 
Worsley, who also died in 1972, the same year as Pearson, was homeschooled in Mexico, then went to public school, and then to the University of Toronto. She graduated first in her class in 1944, during the middle of the Second World War, in maths and physics, and then joined the Canadian Armed Forces. After the war, she went to MIT, where she received her master's degree in computer science and returned to U of T as a lecturer in, com in the nascent computer science department at that time. In the middle of her, that period, she visited Cambridge, England, decided to stay, and became the first woman on the planet to receive a PhD in computer science. Her supervisory committee included Alan Turing and Maurice, the Nobel laureate Maurice Wilkins. Turing, of course, was famous for his groundbreaking work on artificial intelligence and breaking the Enigma code during World War II, and Maurice Wilkins received the Nobel Prize with Watson and Crick for his contributions to the DNA double helix story. Not a bad advisory committee. <laughs> the third plaque I passed is at Mars itself, commemorating the discovery of stem cells right here in Canada in the 1960s by Ernest McCullough and Jim Till. I happen to know Jim Till very well because he was my PhD supervisor. Jim was born and raised on a farm north of Lloyd Mr. Saskatchewan. His research with McCullough, to quote from the remarks made when they received the very prestigious U.S. Lasker Prize, and I quote, became the foundation of a vast effort that explains why bone marrow transplant works for patients with various forms of cancer, anemia, and other diseases. Now, it's not a lecture, but what do Pearson, Worsley, and Till have in common other than the fact that I passed their plaques on my way to work. First, they're all Canadian. Second, their family origins um, were humble. Third, they all graduated, like you, from university. Fourth, they changed the world. And fifth, and this is important, they changed the world, but they didn't do it alone. Pearson had the exceptionally bright minds of the Department of Foreign Affairs behind him. Worsley trained at U of T, MIT, and Cambridge, not exactly distant outposts of higher education. And Jim Till trained at Yale and then came to the Princess Margaret Hospital, arguably the, the best place to do biomedical research in Canada at that time, where he was surrounded by great mentors and colleagues. Like Pearson, Worsley, and Till, you are graduating, I think, at a pivotal moment in time. There are no world wars going on at the moment, but the planet faces threats equal to or perhaps far greater than war. Let me just talk about one of them for a moment. AIDS. AIDS was first identified as an entirely new disease, never before described on this planet, in 1982. Within just two years, two French scientists uh, showed that it was caused by a virus, HIV. In 1984, Margaret Heckler, the U.S. Secretary for, Hu for Health and Human Services, declared there would be a vaccine within two years. It's now 2019, 33 years later, and we still don't have a vaccine. Uh, and since that time, close to 40 million people have died of HIV AIDS, more than the population of this country. And today, close to 40 million people are infected with the virus, and about 1 million people will die of AIDS this year. But there's some good news. In a remarkably short period of time, new drugs have been developed that have changed this disease from a death sentence to a chronic disease. It is a remarkable, remarkable victory of science over this virus in an incredibly short period of time. It's one that is not celebrated enough uh, anywhere, actually. And although we still don't have a vaccine, remarkable progress is happening over the past decade, driven by sophisticated approaches that combine uh, DNA sequencing, uh, systems vaccinology, dissecting the evolution of antibody selection, interesting structural biological analysis of anti-HIV antibodies, uh, etc. The global effort to stop transmission of the virus requires people working on all aspects of the bio biology, the psychology, behavioral issues, uh, epidemiology, immunology, vaccinology, clinical trials, omics, computational biology, and artificial intelligence. Uh, I happen to know a lot about HIV because, as Baggy uh, told you, I worked for four years in New York at the, heading up the global HIV vaccine enterprise. Uh, but clearly, 
despite the progress after 35 years and an annual expenditure on HIV vaccine research globally of about a billion dollars US every year, we still don't have a vaccine. No shortage of money. So what's needed? Well, what's needed is what's always needed. Great people. Great people are always the solution to big challenges. Um, and particularly, great young people. As graduates of one of Canada and the world's great universities, I think you have a special responsibility. You are amongst the world's elite, the very few people on the planet who have been educated in an institution of higher learning. You may be thinking it's impossible to change the world, or you're not interested in HIV, which is fine, or you, how can you possibly do this alone? My response is the following. First, the world's always changing. Change is part of the air we breathe. The challenge is not change, per se, but rather ensuring that change will build the world that we want. Second, humanity faces many challenges today, almost none of which were recognized as a problem just a few decades ago. Climate change, renewable energy, the refugee cr crisis, income and opportunity inequality, food and water insecurity, antibiotic resistance, emerging infectious diseases, mental illness, dementia, to name just a few. Who knows what new challenges lurk around the corner? The best we can do to prepare for these unmet challenges and undefined challenges is to educate young people and expect that they, i.e. you, will have the requisite skills and determination to take them on. And third, who said you should do it alone? Despite the mythology, great achievements are rarely the result of a single individual's actions. Teamwork, collaboration, and strong institutions like Western are all key to moving the needle. CIFAR, the organization that I lead, has a disarmingly simple vision bring together extraordinary researchers across disciplines and countries to collaborate, to tackle questions of importance to science and to humanity. This simple vision has led to transformative ways of thinking about population health, early childhood development, the origins and evolution of our planet, artificial intelligence, and the genetic networks that underlie health and disease. Today, we support close to 400 fellows global scholars and advisors from 24 countries working in over 120 institutions. I'm very pleased and proud as a graduate now of this university to remark that here at Western, Professors Mel Goodale and Adrian Owen direct one of CIFAR's 13 programs. The goal of their program, called Brain, Mind and Consciousness, is to understand the meaning of consciousness and the relationship between our brain and our mind. Their program is made up of cognitive psychologists, brain imagers, molecular geneticists, psychiatrists, and philosophers from over half a dozen countries. It is typical of CIFAR's programs. They all ask important, complex questions. Their membership comprises the world's very best researchers from different areas of science, and we actually don't expect all of them to be successful. That's what taking risks is all about. And so another piece of advice, don't surround yourself with, pe with people who think like you do. Do the opposite. Challenge yourself constantly by surrounding yourself with exceptionally bright people who think differently than you do, who are fun to work with, and who want to make you jump out of bed every morning. I've had the great privilege of tackling important questions and being surrounded by people, especially my trainees, who are both different and smarter than I am. In his book, The Future, Al Gore talks about the profound changes about to hit our world. He ignores, though, the most important driver of change, young people. Your generation has a global perspective that the world has never seen before. You combine, uniquely, I think, a global view with energy, initiative, enthusiasm, and fearlessness, and the desire to apply what you have learned to make the place, the world, a better place. You are why I am so optimistic about the future, and you will be, without doubt, the most important driver of change in this century. So in your search for deciding what you want to do for the rest of your life, just remember three things, not five or ten, just three things. First, you're not deciding what you want to do for the rest of your life. You're deciding what you want to do for the next few years. Second, 
Don't aim for perfection. Aim for impact. Change the world. As Leonard Cohen put it in Anthem, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And third, surround yourself with colleagues, mentors, and people who complement this and not duplicate the skills and the personality that you bring to the table. It's customary in these speeches to encourage graduates to follow their passion. My, my advice today is going to be different. As of today, you are graduating from one of the world's top universities. You are amongst a privileged few. It's time to give back. It's time to make a difference in the world. And so my very last piece of advice is this. Live a life with purpose and change the world. We're counting on you. Congratulations.